the, um, I mean, seriously, this is a, this is an example. And, and I know I, I met people, one story, you got, you got time for a story? Okay. Uh, one little story, one little story. I met a person in Ocean Springs, Missis, no, in, uh, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, that in, in a Lowe's, you know, store over there, I was, uh, Walking in, and as I walked in, there was some a couple, a husband and wife, that pe- kind of passed down the aisle, and he had a wonderful haircut like mine, and and uh, he was pulling a uh, pulling a buggy, and uh, he and his wife were there, and it had been pouring down rain, and I was wiping my head off, and he said, uh, "You get your hair wet coming in?" I said, "Yeah, I did," and I always worry about that because you know when it dries, it's such a mess. But anyway, the uh, uh, he said, uh, so we struck up a little conversation, and he was a contractor, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, his wife was behind him, and so he was talking to me and asking me about, you know, okay, uh, well, where do you, where are you, and who you work, blah, blah. Anyway, and she said, well, he's the pastor at Freedom River Church. His wife said this. I hadn't even really looked at her because I was talking to him, and I hadn't even really noticed her. And she said, he's the pastor at, uh, at Freedom River Church. And she said, uh, yeah. She said, we've been a time or two. I mean, this guy, I don't think he, he had, but she had uh, with some other family members. They've been a time or two to our church. They live over in, um, in Pascagoula or somewhere. So they're not like people, regular people for us, but they come from time to time with family. And they said, this is the church that is so much fun to be a part of. And she said, I tell, I, man, the Bible school has been just amazing. That's what she said. And she said, uh, when is Bible school? And I I, you know, I said, well, I'm not positive uh, Melissa does that. And so it starts next week. So if you're watching online or if you hear about this or anybody that wants to have your children in some of the greatest instruction and fun times, that place will look, it's no telling. Before you come in next Sunday morning, you need to just walk down there about three or four stores down, look at the student ministry building because it'll be It'll be, it'll be transformed into whatever environment they need for the next uh, whole summer uh, for Bible school and uh, the focus on what they're going to be doing for Jesus. It's amazing. So much energy, so much wherewithal. I mean, these are, you know, quality people just do quality things. That's just all it is to it, you know, and you wonder why are some people successful and some people not? Why do some people, you know, really strive and they, and they over, they just overachieve almost and some people just lag behind and it's just not really, discipline is the word that goes in there, you know, sacrifice of yourself. You want to, if you want to be successful, be disciplined in life. Yeah, I mean, do, yeah. do the right things. Find people that are going in the right de- direction. Attach yourself to those people. Let those people become your friends and the people that motivate you and move you forward. And let them inspire your life and sow into your life. And create. I mean, look at them and say, that's a person I'd like to be like. If you, don't, if, if you can't look at them and say, you know, I'd like to be like them, then use the spiritual gift of goodbye and wave bye-bye. You, you know, you're not part of my life. I mean, you, I'm not cursing you or anything, but hey, I'm going, I, I'm going to find those people that are going somewhere. I'm going to find those people that are moving forward in life, and they're going to become the people that inspire me and move me and motivate me, and I'm going forward. Melissa's one of those great people like that. I'm serious. Your children will be so blessed by just her leadership and, and, and uh, you know, James Todd works with her all the time and works with our junior high kids. I'm serious. That is the most tremendous environment that you've ever seen for children's ministry and youth ministry. It's just amazing what God does. And so I encourage you, even if you're watching online, hey, take the next eight weeks or so, come here and put your children down there and you'll be blessed because of it. I promise you it'll be good. Maybe you can endure what's going on in here uh, and just sacrifice for your kids, all right, because <laughs> this is down there. So anyway, that's just my word about that. And, uh, and I met somebody at a Lowe's store that I didn't know from Adam's house cat that said, that gave that testimony, you know, that's a, that's a fun church, you know, that's that fun church that is just great to go to, and the Bible school is amazing, and that was a mom whose children had been there, so praise the Lord for that. All right, uh, what a word, what a word, the last word, well, all of the music and the praise and the worship, but what a great word for a suffering church. You are good, you're good. You're never going to let us down. Today, we're looking at the second church in this series of letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. 
You know, the book is about, according to the verse 18 of the first, verse 19 of the first chapter, right, John, John, uh, here's, Jesus is saying, John, here's my word to, to reveal what, everything I want people to know about the future and about what's coming and about how to be, be prepared. I want you to write the things that were, he says in verse 19, which is the glory of Jesus, what Jesus, what we've already seen about Jesus, what we know about Jesus, the greatness, the glory, the power, the majesty, uh, the respect, the honor of Jesus Christ. And the first chapter is all about seeing Jesus We've seen him this way. This is the way he is. This is who he is. So write what you have already seen about Jesus. And then he says, write the things that are. In other words, tell them like it is, John. Tell them how things are. How are things? Well, he said, I have seven churches here that represent exactly how things are. This is the way things are. And let's use these seven churches as examples of how things are. What are the people facing? What, are they, what do they need to know? How do they need to see spiritual life, church life, Christian life, prophetically? How is, how is the church going to move through, through the, the series of time from the time Jesus left this earth and the church is born in the book of Acts? How, how is it going to be through the ages of the church so that the people can see this is how church life, spirit life, th these are the challenges. This is the direction. This is, this is how it is, man. Tell them like it is and don't pull any punches about it. And so there comes a series of seven letters in chapters 2 and 3. There are seven churches, seven real churches, literal churches that are in a little, in a little circle. Actually, if you look at them on a the map, you know, you got Ephesus right here in the middle. And then you go up about 35 miles north. You got Smyrna. Then when you leave Smyrna, you go to Pergamos. And then when you leave Pergamos, you go to Thyatira. When you leave Thyatira, you go to Sardis. When you go to Sardis, you go to Philadelphia. And then you end up back down here with Laodicea, which is where we are now in church life, the lukewarm church that he's going to spew out of his mouth. You know, I'm sorry to say that. I mean, as great as we get in here and worship and honor and stomp our feet and jump up and down, uh, obviously we are in the last church age, which implies what? I mean, I'm just trying to kind of get you thinking this way. If God is, if God is showing us this is how the, the, the church is going to be through the ages, and this is how it's going to move prophetically through the ages, he's telling us the church is going to start out like Ephesus, and then within a period of time, it's going to become like Smyrna, and then within a period of time, it's going to become like Pergamos, and then another period of time, it's going to become like Thyatira, then it's going to become Sardis, then it's going to move to Philadelphia, and then it's going to move the last to Laodicea, which means prophetically, it means on the calendar of what is to come, we're in the last church age, which means there are no more, which means we don't move to another age. We are in the last one, which implies what? He's coming. I mean, there are no more after this, and this is the word, and this is one of the ways you look at the letter to the seven churches is prophetically. Also, uh, you look at it practically, which just means that within every church, there are people described, and there are doctrines described, and there are hardships described, and there are good things uh, described, which can be in any church at any time in any age. In other words, these are not just exclusive letters to some churches that used to be here 2,000 years ago, and they're not here anymore, and it's a great thing historically to hear about them, but it doesn't really mean anything. No, these churches represent church life. It represents the leadership of the church. It means the, the people, the pastors and the leaders of the church and the leaders of where things go theologically and spiritually and dynamically, people that are trained like Wesley's going to be trained, who are going to determine the direction of congregations, individual congregations. These leaders are going to be leading in certain directions. They're going to be allowing things and disallowing things. They're going to be preaching on things. They're going to be hammering on things. They're going to let things go or whatever it might be, and that's how the church is going to kind of move in, in, in its direction and its focus and all of that stuff. And so in every church, in every age, there's some of these individual things. So practically, it doesn't mean when we get in a church age that everybody in the church in that age is like described here. It just means that the general direction of spiritual life as compelled by the leadership is in this general direction. So there might be great fired up people in Laodicea, 
I mean, I, I mean, the only thing we would need to do differently here is jump up, you know, and start tearing the lights out of the ceiling or something else to be more enthusiastic about the things of God. I wouldn't look at many of you uh, and say, you're lukewarm. I, I really wouldn't. I would say, hey, even though you're in a lukewarm church age, the general, the general church is generally lukewarm. It's not hot and it's not cold. It's indifferent. You know, it's like, okay, well, church is great, but hey, I can give it or t- I, can, I can do with it or do without it. You know, I don't go to church, blah, blah. I mean, all of the sentiments that you hear nowadays about why people aren't committed, why they don't believe in church, why they don't go to church, why church doesn't mean anything. I, I just heard this is just an example of what I'm talking about. And I can't even remember what country it was. It seemed like it was Italy or some, it was one of the European countries that has been a bastion for Catholicism, and I'm not bashing Catholicism by saying this. I just, it's just an example, all right? I mean, we Christians can be just as much an example, but, but, but in this particular country this past week, they had a vote on abortion, and it was to whether they were going to allow abortions in their country or not allow abortions, because up until now, abortion has been outlawed in this particular country, and if you know what it is, say it so I can get the right name. Ireland, Ireland. And Ireland has been looked at as a bastion of Catholicism. And Catholicism, I don't know if you guys know this, Catholics don't believe in abortion. I mean, a staunch, true, believing, real, scriptural Catholic, they would say abortion is a murder. It's a no-no. I mean, we're not having it. And that country was highly Catholic. I mean, overwhelmingly Catholic. So what does that mean? It means that the people felt like the church they belonged to. They felt like that abortion is a no-no, and the country had outlawed for all of these generations abortion and said, in our country, no, you cannot have an abortion. And this past week, the people voted, and the people said, we strike down that, and from now on, you can have an abortion. Now, what does that mean or what does it show? Well, it shows exactly what happens through the age of church life. It shows that what the church they belong to believes in doesn't matter to them anymore. It means those individual people used to think that that was wrong. It was a sin against God. It was a breaking of the commandment, thou shalt not murder. But now, because of the looseness, because of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the thinking of the people and the no longer conviction that, that God's word really means what it says, they say, well, you know, live and let live. We'll allow it. It's, you know, hey, everybody to each his own, and we don't have a right to tell anybody. Blah, 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 blah. All that other junk that we justify leaving God's word for that's, that's, what, that's what happens. That's the looseness of the age, and that just reflects. That's just a picture of what Laodicea is all about. Lukewarm. Hey, let's go to church. Let's bow. Let's say our prayers. Let's put in our penance. Let's do whatever we want to do because, hey, church is really important, but everything that Christ teaches and the Bible teaches, ah, well, to each his own. It's a, just an attitude of your spirit and heart that moves away from the things of God and becomes lukewarm. And God said, I wish you were hot or cold, and because you're lukewarm, I spit you out of my mouth. Strong word from the Lord. That's the last age. That's the age we're in. There are no more ages. So I'm going to say like T.D. Jake says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. (laughs) Yeah, get ready. Here I come. Ready or not, here I come. But now we're in the second letter. The first letter was to Ephesus, the first church that came on the scene. Lots of stuff is known about Ephesus. In comparison, not much is known about Smyrna. Smyrna is the second church. If you go up 35 miles north of Ephesus, you're going to run into a little church called Smyrna. Smyrna might have even started as a mission of Ephesus, you know. But Smyrna, unlike Ephesus, you remember Ephesus' problem? You remember the first church age problem? The first age, that what Jesus said about the first church was, uh, you used to have a hot heart for me. You used to be burning with passion. I used to be your heart throb. But now, 40 short years after you had a heartbeat for me and you loved me, he didn't say you didn't love me anymore. He didn't say you've run away from me and you've blasphemed me and you've cursed me. He just said, you don't love me like you used to. So to Ephesus, he says, the problem you have is you've left your first love. 
you're getting complacent. You're getting, you know, you don't have passion for me anymore. Uh, give, give me that passion back. And he told them how to do it. Now, quite contrary to what he says to Ephesus, the church at Smyrna was basically just the opposite. The church at Smyrna was a church that was severely persecuted. These people were stomped on. These people were, these people were under arrest. These people were persecuted by the government. They were, they were under the thumb of Rome. They had a bunch of people there that, were, that, were, that stirred up the government. And every time the believers tried to do anything, they would run off like little sneaky rats that they were and tell the government and say, oh, you can't let them do that. I mean, just if you looked at our world today with these malcontents and these people that carry banners around and protest everything that's righteous, you know, they'd stir up a crowd. They'd get a crowd outside the church and protest the fact that these people believed that people were going to heaven and that Jesus was king and without him you couldn't go to heaven. That's not fair. That's discrimination, blah, blah, blah. And that's the way these old Jews that acted like they were true believers, but they were just reprobates. They were synagogues of Satan is what Jesus says they are. They stirred up the government. They, they brought lawsuits. They, they, they kept Rome involved in the church and persecuting the church. Every time the church turned around, the, the Roman IRS was audited them. I mean, every time the church turned around, there were officers in the church uh, looking at what they said and trying to find something wrong and keeping the government stirred up so they were always under the thumb and under the persecution of the Roman government. And here's what happened. The more the church at Smyrna was persecuted, the stronger their love for Jesus became. This is an amazing thing, folks. This is true about us. Do you know what our biggest problem is in our love for Christ and our dedication for him? This is going to surprise you when I say this, but this is true. The greatest test of our love for Jesus and our seeking of Jesus is not persecution. When we get persecuted, we become stronger. You think about it in your own life. Think about it when you had it tough. Think about it when he was your only alternative. Think about it when you were so crushed and devastated, put down, you had no hope, no help, no future. What did you do? Most of the time, you got on your knees and you cried out to God, God help me, and you became the most spiritual person you've ever seen in your life. You prayed, you begged God, you pleaded with God, you never missed a service, you honored God, blah, blah, blah. But when you got prosperous, when you got fat, happy, and sassy, your bills were all paid. There was a Cadillac in the garage, and you had four meals a day on the table or as much as you want. What did you do then? You got fat, happy, and sassy. You got full of yourself. You got arrogant. You forgot the one that brought you there. You didn't need God. You had all you needed. So I'm telling you, the greatest test of Christianity is not persecution. It's prosperity. And, and, and so Smyrna was a church that was persecuted. And I'm going to tell you what. I mean, I'm not predicting anything, but I'm just saying that uh, should we become persecuted, which probably is not far off, but when we become persecuted for our love for Christ, and I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but everything that stands for right and righteousness is moving toward being persecuted these days. Now, you say, oh, they're not killing us and hanging us on a cross and putting us in prison. No, but every time we do something, there's a lawsuit, there's an IRS investigation, there's judgments against us, there are lawsuits, there are criminal cases, there are government alphabet agencies that come in and hassle you and harass you and, 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 and try to take away your initiative to move forward and put fear in you and all of that kind of stuff. What do you call that? Yeah. That's persecution in the 21st century. That's what it is to try to hinder you from doing what Christ has called you. And anybody can believe anything in the world. You can believe in a, in a, in a non-striped zebra walking down the middle of the highway becoming the Messiah of the world, and the government says, Hey, great, hey, I'm with you for religious freedom. Uh, you have all the rights in the world. But say, I love Jesus Christ. The Word of God is the center of my life. And it says that there's a difference. And watch what happens to you. 
person, pr uh, people protesting outside your home. Here lies a racist. Here lies a bigot. Here lies a, uh, you know, somebody that hates everybody. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, any kind of insult they can possibly imagine organized against you for the purpose of harassing you and stopping you from serving Christ. Only Jesus is under attack. Look at it. If you don't believe me, whatever country it might be, look at who is the one who's persecuted. Look at the one who's negatively cast in any press release. It's, it, it, it's those who stand for something. And we don't, look, we don't stand for something because we want to be bigots and separatists and nationalists and whatever other word they want to use. Look, I, you know why I stand for a lot of things that this world stands against? Because my Bible tells me that sin is sin and righteousness is righteousness. And I'm going to tell you, if I didn't stand for that, I'm not much of a Christian. Because that Bible is the center of our life. That is the Word of God. That's not just made up by a bunch of men that want to keep this world in a certain order. That is God's holy Word to us to say, this is your guidebook. This is what right and wrong. This is what your life is about. And so as we say, this is the... Look, you tell me you're a Christian and you don't stand for what this Word says you're to stand for, I'm going to say, you don't know Him. I'm going to say, you're like, you man, you're a fake. You're a plastic Jesus on your dashboard, Christian. Bobblehead Jesus. I mean, it's just, I, I'm trying to, look, this is what Jesus said to us. Tell it like it is. Don't pull punches. Don't soft pedal. Don't mix up vocabulary words so the people can't understand what you're talking about. Tell them straight. The letters to the seven churches are, tell them straight. Tell them like they can believe it. And to the church at Smyrna, Jesus said, let's just read what he said. These are some just wonderful. Look, look to this suffering, persecuted church that's dying for Jesus, that's running around like a bunch of vagabonds on the street begging for people to help them because they couldn't keep a job, couldn't get a job. You put on your resume, I'm a member of the church at Smyrna, then the committee would say, we don't want that around. They'll stir up trouble in the business. They, they're those heathen hypocrites that think everybody's going to hell and all. I mean, we don't want them in there. They're going to make a mess of our business. So they couldn't get a job, couldn't hold a job. I mean, it was almost like putting a placard in your front yard saying, Christian bigot, don't have anything to do with them. And so that's what Smyrna was suffering. They were under the thumb. They were being persecuted. They were being snuffed out and smashed under the, under the, uh, the heavy hand of a government that was trying to put the church out of, the, out of business. And just like a child, when a child is hurt, you've had children... Your children are all independent out there running around laughing. Don't touch that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I mean, little independent fellas just doing everything they can to, you know, be rebellious and, and learn and be inquisitive and blah, 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 blah. You let them get hurt, and what happens? Man out there, they're all laughing. I don't even know. And then let them get hurt. First thing they do is run to mama. They come running. Why you? I mean, you don't have to call them back. You just have to sit there, and they just run into your arms. They cry and they say, "Mama, mama, 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 mama." That's what happens to Christians when we get hurt. When we get hurt, we run to the arms of Jesus. We run to Jesus, and and we hug him, and we say, "You know, help me. I'm hurt. Comfort me. Strengthen me. Bless me. Hear my wound. Help me, mama." I mean, and that's what happens to the church when the church is persecuted. Unlike Ephesus, where everything becomes, they start out with a hot heart, and then things get better and better and better and better and better and better, and they start losing their first love, which, by the way, is the first step towards separation of fellowship. Now, notice I stress the word fellowship because we have relationship with God, which is I'm his son, which means I've committed myself to him and he's going to keep my commitment until the day he comes after me. It's not up to me. He birthed me. He's Papa, no matter whether I'm in prison or whether I'm out serving him like Billy Graham. I don't care. You get a child, you birth him. He's yours for the rest of your life. He may become an axe murderer or a school shooter or whatever he might become or President of the United States. 
Whatever he becomes, you're, he's still your son and you're still his dad no matter what. You are related to him. Fellowship is, is, is different. Fellowship is based on what you do. If you obey, you're close. If you disobey, you're not close. Some of you are close to your parents because you're, you represent their values. You're obedient. You're disciplined. They, they, you can go eat supper with them, and they'll be happy as a lark, and they won't be condemning and blah, blah. You can come borrow the tools out of their shed. You can get their lawnmower. I mean, you can do anything. Why? Because you have a close relationship with them. Our relationship is dependent on obedience and discipline and so forth. And I'm just saying that the first step away from uh, from fellowship with Christ is to allow yourself to become lazadaisical about the things of God, to lose that passion for Christ. So Ephesus is that. Well, Smyrna is started, and they're trying to serve the Lord, and they're being smashed on every hand, and they're running to Jesus and saying, oh, we need you, Christ. So they are a suffering minority of people under persecution with their arms around Jesus, and, and, and they're being killed, and they're being put in prison, and they're suffering martyrdom and everything else. And look at what Jesus has to say to them. By the way, this is the only church of the seven in which Jesus has no word of condemnation whatsoever. He doesn't, he doesn't have one negative word to say about them. Look at this, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but they are not, but are actually the synagogues of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What an encouraging word to a bunch of suffering, smashed down Christians. Look, guys. Hey, I, I, I'm here with you. Look, matter of fact, who's writing? Look at how he introduces himself, and you know this because of the pattern, that when Jesus identifies himself, he's, he, he uses terms that refer back to chapter 1 where he identifies who the letter is from, and, and he just picks out a, a description of what he was back then and says, this is the same one that was back then, and here's what I want you to think about, about who I am to you and what you need. And he says, and to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things say the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Why would Jesus say that to them? Why would Jesus introduce himself like that to them? Because they were being suffered, being persecuted. Because they were being put to death. Because they were being martyred for Christ. So he says, look, I want you guys to know the one who's writing to you knows how it feels. The one writing to you suffered like you suffered. The one writing to you died like some of you are going to die. The one writing to you is the first and the last. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm not, I'm not going to put you in something and then I'm going to let you go and take my hand. I know what it's like to be persecuted, to suffer, to die on a cross, to be spit on, broken down, stabbed in the side, put in a grave, disrespected, dishonored, run away from. I know what it means to suffer and I just want you to know I used to be dead but I came back to life so you can know even though they may kill you and persecute you you're with somebody who knows how it feels and just like I came back to life I'm just telling you don't worry about it you're coming back to life too so Jesus says lift your head up high church at Smyrna you're faithful and I'm with you all the way. I'm the first. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I don't start you and then let you go. I'm with you all the way. Just know that, that you are in my hand the whole time. Smyrna, you know what Smyrna means? It means myrrh. Myrrh, you know what myrrh is, right? Some of you remember, I see the bells dinging. I can almost hear them right up here. You're going, myrrh, woo. Yeah, myrrh. Myrrh is a, is a plant, comes from a plant, you know, or 
And the plant, now let me just describe it to you. The plant that myrrh comes from is a scraggly little bush that grows in Africa. Now, I'm just saying this to you and those that you are spiritual and have heard many scriptures and passages described about what Jesus was like might identify the fact. Now, just think of like that for a second. Here's a scraggly little thorny twig coming out of the ground. Got sticker thorns all over it. Got a few little bitty leaves up here, ragged little scraggly looking something. Does, this, does the passage, there's no beauty that he should be desired? Does that pop into your mind? <laughs> scraggly little bush comes up out of the ground, got thorns all over it. Everybody walked by it. And it had no smell, no fragrance, no aroma. It was something somebody would be going by and say, whoo, don't let your donkey get close to that. I mean, it would be something you would just really look at and disrespect totally because it has no beauty that you would desire. It was not a shade tree. It was nothing that anybody would think would amount to anything. And there's no fragrance. But if you cut the bark of that tree and you let the resin of the tree come out, everybody think the blood of Jesus. Think about he was broken for us. Think about he was pierced with a spear. Think about, I mean, just, I, I, I'm just carrying you. Do, you. do you folks like to think spiritually like this? Or you, you want me to just pass that by? All right, all right. But you cut the bark and the resin comes out. When the air hits the resin, the resin begins to harden. When it, begin, when it gets hard, if you take it and you begin to crush up the resin, it begins to have this wonderful fragrance. In other words, there's no beauty, there's no desire, there's nothing until it's cut and then it's crushed like Christ was crushed on the cross. And, and, all, and, 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 the, and, and here's the, the kicker, the more you crush it, the more fragrant it becomes. And so God just doesn't miss any tricks in the analogies and everything he uses. The church at Smyrna was named Smyrna, which as might as well be the church at Myrrh. Now, apart from the few times in the book of Revelation that the word Myrrh is mentioned, and it's only mentioned when, when it mentions the church at Smyrna, there are only three other times that the word myrrh is mentioned in the New Testament. And I wrote it in your notes so you would have it. One, one time the word myrrh is mentioned is when at the birth of Jesus, when Jesus became a little child, a young child. Don't make the mistake of thinking the wise men came to the manger. When you see that in somebody's yard, say, they don't know the Bible. The wise men did not come to the manger. The Bible clearly says, folks, I'm not making this up. Read Matthew 2. It says, and the wise men came to the house where the young child was. And they brought three gifts. You remember? Gold for the king, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh is a, is a material that is used to bury people with. It's a, it, it is an anointing spice that people bring to the tomb to anoint the body in honor of its, of its, of its sweet-smelling fragrance and to cover the stench of not being embalmed. I mean, come on, let's get practical about it. I mean, back then, they didn't drain the blood and blah, 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 blah. And I mean, every corpse was, a, was a, you know, they wrapped it up as much as possible so it wouldn't stink as, you know, as bad as it normally does. And then they'd put myrrh and aloes and all that on it so that it could cover up the fragrance. And myrrh was such a strong, strong aroma that they used it as, as, a, as a, an anointing after death. Speaking of what, when, when, they brought, when they brought baby Jesus, our young child Jesus, myrrh, it just said, we recognize that you came to die for us. It was an honor of his death. Come on, guys. It, it was a word of prophecy before. He, I mean, he's a, he's a young child, and, and God saying, even as a young child, I want you to know what your mission is. You're going to die. That's, what, that's what's going to happen to you. The second time it was mentioned, he was, ha he, 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 was, he was hanging on a cross. And the soldiers brought him myrrh mixed with wine because myrrh is also an anesthetic, a pain reliever. It was mixed with wine in order when you drink it, it would anesthetize your body so that you wouldn't feel the pain. And so when they put it on a sponge and put it up to Jesus' mouth, the Bible said, Jesus said, get that stuff away from me. 
I want to feel every pain. I, want to, I don't need your anesthetic anymore. The third time myrrh is mentioned is the day the ladies were coming to embalm his body after three days after, after, after the end of the, of the Passover and unleavened bread season of life. They, they, got, they had a hundred pounds of aloes and frankincense, I mean, frank, and myrrh, and they were on their way to the tomb. And when they got to the tomb, the angel said, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. Take your myrrh back home because he doesn't need it. He didn't stay dead. And I'm just saying to you, the church at Smyrna is the church of myrrh. And myrrh is a wonderful picture of Christ and the greatness of Christ. And the more we're crushed, the, the stronger our fragrance is into the nostrils of God. The Bible says that, that our prayers are like sweet-smelling incense that extends to the nostrils of God. And the nostrils of God suck our fragrance in when we honor Him and worship Him and are sacrificed and are faithful to Him. And this is the church at Smyrna. This is what God says your life is to be alike. And though Ephesus started hot and ended up a little more cold, Smyrna started persecuted, and the more they persecuted them, the hotter their heart became for God. And to that church, Jesus said, I don't have a word of negative to say to you. All I have is an encouragement for you because you, you need my encouragement and you need to know what's going on. And to them, he says, I'm the first and the last and I'm Alpha and Omega and I'm him that was alive, uh, was dead and I'm alive again. And just like me, you're going to go forth. All right, what's right in the church? Let me mention to this to you because I wrote it in your notes and I want to I wanna just call attention to it because many people don't know about this, maybe never have even heard it. The first pastor at the church at Smyrna was a pastor by the name of Polycarp. And I know you've probably never heard the name Polycarp, but do you know that the, that, the, that the church, when it began on this earth, had leaders that became like what they called church fathers? Mm -hmm. These were the Billy Grahams of the church age. These were the people that people listened to and looked to and said, how's a church supposed to be? And how, I mean, these were, and Polycarp was one of those church leaders. One of those church fathers, I wrote the others, Ignatius and blah, blah, blah. But, but and Clement. But, but here's, what, here's what happened to Polycarp. Let, let me just read it to you. All right. Here's, here's a quote from Polycarp. When they, when they came to take him away, he died a martyr. Polycarp, the pastor of this church, was dragged out of the church and dragged down to the Colosseum to be made a sport for all the heathens to stand around and cheer about. And, and they put Polycarp on a stake and, and set him on fire. But the fire wouldn't burn him up. And so when he wouldn't burn up, they took a stake and they drove it through his heart in order to kill him. And, before, and before they, right before they set him on fire, they must have said, now this is historical writing and you can find this. Look it up. He made a comment that was written down by Roman historians. And here's what he said before they set him on fire. This is the pastor of the church at Smyrna, in case you want to know what kind of person that he was and the church was. Look at this. Eighty and six years I have served him. Now, whether that means he's 86 years old or 86 years since he got saved, I don't know, but he's old. Eighty and six years I have served him. Boy, you talk about, that means he's at least 60 years he was pastor at Smyrna. Tenure, man, tenure, longevity. He said, eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched but you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. Polycarp was burned at the stake and, and was pierced with a spear when the fire failed to touch him for refusing to burn incense to the Roman emperor. That was an insult. That was saying, Caesar's not God. Jesus is God. If you didn't burn incense, it means you didn't believe that Caesar was God. You meant somebody else was, and so you became an insurrectionist and a malcontent against government, and so that's why they could set you on fire. Only Rome had that authority, by the way. The local, the local population couldn't just kill you. The edict had to come from headquarters up there. And, 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 and on his farewell, 
He said, listen to this. Now think about this. You're on a stake. There's a fire around you. You smell the lighter fluid. You see the torch. And you're about to burn, baby, burn. And you think about this man saying that at this time. You think about him looking into the face of his accusers and aggressors and saying, bless God, you, you know about a fire that you're about to light that is going to burn for just a little season. But I'm telling you, buddy, you're going to burn in hell forever. You don't know what the righteousness of God is all about. So I consider it a privilege to suffer for Jesus. I consider it an honor that Christ would consider me worthy to be an example and to burn for him on this day. Go ahead, man. Do your best. He's been faithful to me. And then he said his last words were, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour so that in the company of the martyrs, I might share the cup of Christ. Poof. But this is somebody that's real. This is not bobblehead Jesus worshiper right here. This is the church at Smyrna. This is why they were persecuted. This is why they were hated. Look, it took the devil 300 years. 330 years, is 25 as a matter of fact. It took the devil 325 years. Right after this, this church was in the age of like 180 through 325. That's the years, A.D. Took the devil all the way from basically zero. There is no zero, but let's just say a zero to, to be a start. All the way to 325. That was a, a, the age that we're talking about. Took the devil 325 years to get smart enough to understand that if you keep persecuting the church, it's just going to get closer to Jesus. If you don't, if you don't quit bringing fire against them and tormenting them and pressuring them. Every time you do that, it just runs them to the arms of Papa and makes them closer. It took 325 years to, to understand the devil. He's not really smart. I don't know if you know this. But finally, it came, he came to the conclusion, now, I can't keep doing this because it's not giving me what I want. So instead of persecuting the church in 325, he joins the church. He comes in and marries the church. And oh, brother, does that cause a lot of troubles. Hey, no outside force can mess with us. I guarantee you, you let somebody start persecuting a little tiny Freedom River Church right here in a mall somewhere, and you watch what happens to us. All of you Johnny-come-latelys and all of you per people who are not committed, but you'll run like rats from a sinking ship. And the ones that are real and really know Jesus, they'll just get closer and batten down the hatches and get back to back and become soldiers for Christ. The devil finally understood that and said, I got to stop persecuting them and I got to join them. If I join them, I can destroy them from within. And in 325, when the church marries the world, which you'll see next in Pergamos, the next church age, you'll find out what happens when the devil marries the church. But right now, he's still persecuting them, and he's just making them grow closer to Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, this is what word I have for you. What's right in the church? Look at what he says. I know your works, your toil, your labor. I know your sacrifice. I know everything you're doing for me. Don't make the mistake of thinking I don't know what's going on. Now, when you're being persecuted and you're being hurt and you're sacrificing for someone, I submit to you, and this is one of the little notes you have down there, somewhere along the way. It, 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 when I, I submit to you that when you are suffering for someone, now think about it. You're sacrificing for someone. You're suffering for them. You're giving them something that's costing you something. There's one thing that you really are comforted to know. What is that? That the one that you are sacrificing for knows that you are sacrificing for them, right? Right? Does the person that I'm, that I'm going to death and, and walking through hell and sacrifice, do they know what I'm going through? Do they know the sacrifice that I'm giving? All I, all I want is for them to know that they mean that much to me and they are so special to me that they would just know that whatever it takes, man, I'm giving it, I'm sacrificing. And Jesus said to them, I know your works. I know, not just, to, not just to, 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 to know something by knowledge, but the word that's used there in the Greek is, I know by experience. 
I feel you, that's what he's saying. I know what it's like to be you. I know what it's like to be persecuted, backstabbed, laughed at, betrayed, mocked, ridiculed, beaten, spit at, insulted, hung on a cross. I know from experience what you are going through, and I appreciate your sacrifice. I know your works and your tribulation, which just means never ceasing harassment. I know that every day you're going through persecution, harassment, lawsuits, civil uprising, uh, people looking down their nose, people uh, spitting at you, people uh, choosing evil instead of right, and blah, 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 you know. I know all of that. I know that it's never ending. I know that it's tribulation that never ceases to come. And I know that you're broke as a church house mouse which just means that word poverty, it's not just a regular word for poverty. It means you are penniless. It means you have nothing. You are a zero with the rim knocked off of it. You have nothing. You beggars in the street. But you're rich. You might not have a, a, a dollar to your name, but you are rich. Boy, it's laid up for you up here. You might be on this earth, the most impoverished person on the face of the earth, but Jesus said, you are rich. In the place where it really counts, you're rich. Listen to me. Do you guys know that we're going to spend far more time in eternity than we are here? Do you know that if you live to be 100 years old right now, which would be pretty old, it's getting younger all the time, but, but it would, it would, you would be pretty old if you lived to be 100 years old? that that wouldn't even be a a scratch on a granite monument by the wing of a pigeon compared to what eternity is going to be. Eternity is forever. And and, and that's where the Bible says, send your riches into eternity because that's where you're going to spend the the majority of your existence. Don't worry about this little temporary 100 years or 80 years or whatever many years the Lord gives you. That's not where, I mean, be comforted to know that you can lay up riches in heaven. And how do you lay up riches in heaven? You send them ahead. I mean, a lot of us work for stuff. We have houses. We have good automobiles. We have great toys and assets and uh, comforts of life and everything. And we have everything. And I'm going to ask you, how much of that are you taking with you? None of it. I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul pulling behind it. Or pockets on the inside of burial clothes. I mean, you know, I don't even know why they put a pillow under the head of a corpse. It doesn't make a bit of sense to me. But I'm just saying to you, you're not going to take any of it with you. How much did Howard Hughes leave? He lost, he left everything. So are you. The only thing that you'll have is what you've sent ahead. And Jesus said, I know, you, I know you have nothing right now, and you're begging on the streets like a bunch of, you know, uh, urchins. You got your little hat out hoping somebody will give you enough you can buy your next meal. I, I, know, I know that. You can't get a job. You can't have a life. You can't do anything because they just chase you down and persecute you and harass you and, 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 and politically uh, discharge you from society and do everything to take you out of life. But I just want you to know you're rich. Man, I'm telling you here, I'm rich from Jesus as an encouraging word when I'm suffering. And the blasphemy of those who call themselves Jews. You remember Paul the apostle said, there are people who who have the name of Jews, but they're not really Jews. That's who Jesus is talking about. That bunch of fake, secular, backstabbing weasels. That bunch of reprobate moles and rats, all they're looking for is some way to report you to somebody so they can get you in trouble and harass you and sick the government on you. That's what that bunch, that's what he said. He said, they're not Jews. They're the synagogue of Satan. That's who they are. Don't be mistaken by it. Hey, Jesus said, I see them. I know who they are. I know what you're going through. Hey, Hang on, baby, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one that used to be dead, but I'm not alive. I'm not dead anymore. I came back to life, and you're coming back to life too. 
What's wrong? Jesus didn't have one word of condemnation, only words of encouragement, only words of passion, only words of security and comfort for them. Hey, I don't have a single thing to say negative to you. You're doing it, baby. You're, you're the real thing. And I'm on your side. Hey, make no mistake about it. I got it. I got it right here. And there's going to be a day of reckoning before long, and there's going to be a day of comeuppance. You say, Pastor, why do you believe in heaven and hell? Because I believe in the justice of God. You say, what do you mean? The Bible says God is just. What does just mean? It means fair. It means righteous. I look around and I see these wicked infidels prancing around, acting like some kind of a, you know, well, never mind. But, and I see these reprobates prospering every day. I see everything they, does turn, everything they do turn to gold. I see them laughing and spitting in the face of God, mocking Christianity, ridiculing the things of God, these synagogues of Satan. And I see them prospering and millionaires and respected and putting on TV and, and talking as if because they have money they have any sense, which is absolutely wrong. Just because you have a lot of money and can sing a song on a stage or tell a lie on a movie screen doesn't mean you have any knowledge about anything else you're talking about. I don't care what you think about politics, government, weather, global warming, blah, blah, blah. Just because you can sing a word and get paid for it doesn't mean you know anything about geology. So when they ask you about something and you say the earth is flat and everybody goes, wow, what a wonderful word. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going, what an idiot. Who cares what you think? You don't know, you don't know, you don't know jack squat about what you're talking about. But they put you up on the screen as if somehow you become an expert. But anyway, I'm just trying to, hey, tell it like it is. John said, tell them how it is. I mean, Jesus said, tell them how it is. And I'm just saying, that's what the church at Smyrna is, is a letter to a church that says, these things I'm talking about, this is how it is. You want to know how things are? This is how things are. What is Revelation supposed to do? It's not supposed to give you some historical background so you can understand how a church 2,000 years ago operated. It's to say, this is how this is an example of how it is right now. So whenever you look at it, look at all the different things it says, and that's how it is. To unveil Jesus. What is the book of Revelation? Gosh, y'all, man, I just looked at the clock. It's 1202. No. I, got, I got to quit. I'm sorry. That's how things are. I know it. That's how things are. Let me finish because my wife will get on to me. All right. What to, what to do about it? All right. Here's that little point. The ones for whom you're suffering is aware of your suffering. And he says, I know, I know, I know, which I've already told you means I know by experience. Jesus did it. He went to the cross. He, you remember he was separated from, from the devil for 40 days, and he was tempted by, you know, uh, turning stones to bread. He was up on the temple, throw yourself off. Jesus, God will catch you, blah, blah. And then, and then uh, uh, hear all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, bow down, worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus says, man is not dead by bread alone. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, and the Lord is the only one you serve and not you. For 40 days, he was persecuted, tempted, stressed like that, but he didn't sin, he didn't break, he didn't bow to Satan. So Jesus said, I know what you're going through. I feel you. Not because I have some sight knowledge of it, because experientially I know what it feels like to be you. Make no mistake about it, man. God knows that's what it's like and so forth. So he's aware of our sufferings, and, don't, and then don't worry, I got you back. The second thing you need to know of what to do, what to do, he's just saying, here are the two things I want you to know by what he said. I want you to know, I know what you're going through, so your sacrifice is not in vain. I'm watching you, I see you, and I'm applauding your sacrifice. The one that you're doing this for looks at you and says, Man, I love you. I appreciate you. You're such an honor to me. Glory, glory, glory. Hey, go on, brother. March on. I got you. And the second thing I want you to know is, even though it looks bad for you, I got you back. And he says this by saying in verse 10, don't fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. He didn't say, I'm going to get you out of suffering, does he? 
We'd be sitting down here in the altar going, oh, Jesus, help me. I mean, we would be praying that we would get out of the suffering, right? That would be what we would be praying. And the Lord would be saying, you're not getting out of the suffering. This is one of those times where what we pray and what we get are two different things. <laughs> Does anybody know that that happens? Amen. I mean, I don't want to bust your bubble, but if you're in here because you want Jesus to do good stuff for you, I'm just saying that good stuff is relative, <laughs> right? Good stuff to you might not be good stuff to him, and I guarantee you good stuff to him is not going to make you happy a lot of times. I'm just saying that to you. I'm saying if you Johnny come lately, serve Jesus on a happy day, it's what you're after. you in the wrong place. He says, I know you're about to suffer some thing, and indeed the devil's about to throw some of you in prison, which John already was on the Isle of Patmos, uh, that you may be tested while you're thrown in prison so that you can be tested, not because you're a criminal, outlaw, blah, blah, but because you are going to be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. That's probably the most mystical thought of all that when you read it. They said, what is this 10 days? All right, let me show you some passages, and I'll put them up here just so I, I hopefully won't be confusing to you. I'm running to a finish, all right, so hang on. Uh, Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34 are two passages in the Old Testament that give us some idea as to what these 10 days are. In the Bible, in, 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 in Ezekiel 4, 6, look at what's said, and when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. This is instruction to Ezekiel the prophet who has been commanded to go out in the middle of the city square and lay down on his right side for a certain number of days and then turn over on his left side for a certain number of days so everybody that sees him can go, what in the world is old man Ezekiel as he flipped out? And he's doing that as a sign of, of, of disrespect and rebellion of the nation of Israel so that Israel will see that what God is saying to them and so Ezekiel is being used as an example right out in the city of Square. And this is the conclusion of what God says to him. And when you have completed them, the number of days to lay on the right and the number of days lie on the left, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days. All right? So 40 days you lie on the other side so that Judah will know they're also rebellious. But here's the important part. I have laid on you a day for each year. So that's telling us in prophetic language that God considers a day to represent a year. All right, look at the next one, Numbers 14. This is when Israel has backed up on God in the desert, and God wants to kill them. Read number 14 if you want to see something funny. I mean, God is hot at Israel, and he wants to kill them. He wants to destroy them. He says, I'm tired of this backslidden bunch. I'm tired of these reprobates calling themselves mine. Get out of the way, Moses. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm sending a plague. I'm burning them up. I'm gonna... And Moses gets on his face before God, and Moses says, Moses says, wait, God, wait. If you do this, every, all the nations around here will see that happen, and they'll know that you did it to them. And what kind of testimony is that going to be about a God who's supposed to be a great God and loving people, and they're going to bring them in, and now you've wiped them all out, and all these heathens around here saw you do it, and they'll know it's you. And God said, well, you might be right. So I'll let them live, but I'm not, I, 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 I'm not letting them get off. But uh, I'm going, uh, they, for the next 40 years, they fixing to suffer, buddy. Make no mistake about that. He's fixing to spank some hide for the next 40 years. And only Joshua and only Caleb, the two spies that came back and said, let's go with God. They're the only two that are going to survive this. Everybody 21 years and older who voted, let's go back to Egypt. They're going back, all right, in a coffin. And then the last thing he says, look at it. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. In other words, you're going to be punished. How long? How long is this going to happen? Well, the spies went into the land for 40 years, uh, 40 days. So that means the spies were in there looking around for 40 days. So he said, all right, here's going to be your punishment. Your punishment is, all right, the spies went into the, into the land for 40 days. For each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. One year for each day 
40 days, 40 years, another example of prophetically speaking when God talks about days, these days most likely are representing years, not just one single day. I'm just saying that when we go into the passage, I got to go back, I think. Let me just make sure what I did. Yeah. When God says you're going to suffer for 10 days, he's most likely talking about a 10-year period of time that, the nation, that, that, that Smyrna is going to really be, and Christianity is really going to be in trouble. And you might say, well, when was that? Well, it just so happens. It just so happens that between the year 303 and 313, how many years is that? Ten years. Oh, my goodness, imagine that. For a period of ten years, the greatest persecution the church ever had in the history of Christianity happened between a Roman emperor, Diocletian, and Gaius, his successor. The Christian churches were burned any, any, any scriptural stuff was burned. The pastors were persecuted. They tried to kill all the pastors to destroy the head and the flock will scatter. And then finally in 313, Constantine, who later will become the guy next week, you'll see, Constantine became emperor. Constantine wrote an edict and said, uh, let's quit persecuting the Christians and let everybody worship like they want to worship. And the persecution went away. But for 303 through 313, greatest persecution years the church ever seen in its life. Jesus says, hey, don't worry about it. Ten days you're going to be persecuted. Ten years, get ready, get ready, get ready. Here it comes. I know this is going to happen, but if you'll be faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. So, hey, work your way through it. Hang on, grab a knot, because you're going to get a great reward in heaven. I'm going to give you the crown of life. There are five crowns. I wrote them in your notes so you can see them. If you're a Christian, you're getting at least one of those crowns. And one of these days, and I know this is hard to believe because we're all so carnal and so self-centered, but it's hard to imagine in human flesh that one of these days, the greatest honor of our life is not what we get, but what we can give. And we'll lay our crowns before Jesus Jesus will be coming down the street. It'll be lambs, you know, parade for the, for the mar marriage festival of the lamb and the supper of the lamb. And, and we're going to be on line in the streets. And, and the first people, I believe, the first people that are going to be able to lay their crowns at the feet of Jesus are those people that have suffered and died the martyr's crown, the crown of life. I've given my life. There's the crown, Jesus, and we'll be happy to lay our crown in. And the more crowns we have, the better we're going to like it. I, I know that means nothing to a carnal Christian or a carnal, not mean a Christian, but a carnal human. We're human. And it's hard for us to take ourselves out of the way and say, what do I get? But, but, but th that's what it's going to be. And then one last little word, the last verse, he's talking to lost people in the church. If you're here this morning, you're lost. You don't know the Lord. Here's the word for you. See, there are a lot of people that sit in church and they look like they're Christians. Or maybe you've been in church all their life and you think, okay, I know the Bible and I've been to Bible school and so I'm a Christian. No, you're not. If you've never surrendered to Christ, you're not a Christian. And, and Jesus has a word for you in these letters to the seven churches because remember, this, is, this means it's not too late. You're sitting here right now in a church, you still have time. And here's what he says. He says, the Spirit says to the church, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Hey, look. He who overcomes means he who is victorious. That's what it literally means. How do you get victorious? What does the Bible say? The Bible says in the Gospel of John that, that, that he who overcomes the world. And how do you overcome the world? By giving your heart to Christ. Surrender makes you victorious. So he's saying, if you will surrender, you can become victorious. And if you become victorious, the second death is not going to touch you. We'll get to this in the book of Revelation. Believe me, we're just bumping along right now. This book is, is going to touch you in ways you, you don't know and you've never seen. But in, in, the, in the 20th chapter of Revelation, it talks about the, the first death and the second death. There are two deaths to die. The first death is a physical death. It means your body dies. We all taste the first death. You're not getting out of this alive. But the second death is spiritual death. It's death where you're taken and you're cast in the lake of fire forever. 
And that doesn't mean you're annihilated. I know a lot of times when we get there, people will read that, and that means that we get thrown in with the devil finally to the, to the big house of eternity, and it's the lake of fire, and somehow when we hit it, we're going to be annihilated like we never existed. No, it means you're thrown in there, and you're going to be tortured and tormented forever. You along with your daddy, the devil, because you loved him and served him and you didn't submit to Christ and you're going to be tormented and punished for the rest of eternity in a lake of fire. That is the second death. And he said, if you'll let Christ come into your heart, you'll become victorious and you won't taste the second death. We that know Christ don't die twice. We just die once. We're a once born group of men in the world of a of a, of, a, of a twice dead group of men who don't understand anything about our lives. And Christ said, come on, join in. You still have time. See, even writing to the seven churches, he's still gospel. He's still, he's still evangelical. He's still saying, come to me. You got time. Come on, man. Come on, man. Have you got your ears on, good buddy? Listen to what I'm saying. So all I'm saying to you is, this is how it is. Deal with it. This is what Christ, look, the book of Revelation is to reveal, take the cover off, talk to us straight about what Jesus said. There it is. All right, stand your feet.